reports reached Rome that many strange signs were occurring all over the region. A palm tree mysteriously caught on fire. Blood appeared in a pool. An ox had spoken in Sicily. Even the Spear of Mars had moved on its own. What did all this mean? Well, it meant the gods were speaking, and so before any deliberations could take place in the Senate, the signs needed to be read and interpreted by the soothsayers. Only after it was determined that the gods were pleased could the Senate deliberate on the year's assignments. And so with that, the new elections took place for the year 214 BC. Fabius Maximus was re-elected consul. Marcellus was also elected consul yet again. But this time he was able to accept the command without any political impediments. The consuls and senate also passed a decree to extend the command of the previous consul, Gracchus. This made sense since Gracchus was not only an accomplished general, but he also was already camped opposite Hannibal in Apulia. So it made little sense to disturb the army units there with a new commanding officer. Valerius also had his command extended. He was stationed on the coast of Brundisium. His main task was to coordinate the naval efforts in the Adriatic Sea and prevent Philip of Macedon from making a landing in Italy. Quintus Fabius Maximus, the son of Fabius Maximus, was also assigned two legions in Apulia. By the way, the function of the Praetor changed over time. Before the Punic War started, only the two Roman consuls were granted Imperium. In Latin, Imperium means power to command. Now, before the Punic Wars, Praetors served mostly in judicial and civic capacities. But during the Punic Wars, Rome needed more army commanders. So Praetors were granted Imperium as well. All right, so two legions were based in Gaul, two in Sicily, and two in Sardinia. A single legion checked in at Picenum. Also, two legions were garrisoned in Rome to protect the capital. And, of course, the Scipio brothers maintained their respective armies in Spain, opposing Hasdrubal and two Carthaginian armies. Naval forces were also increased to a grand total of 150 vessels. Livy relates that in 214 BC, the Romans were able to field 18 legions. This included six new legions. No one could doubt the resolve of the Roman Senate and people. The entire republic was on a total war footing. The Roman army now numbered well over 200,000 soldiers. As usual, the bulk of the Roman army was focused on Hannibal. It is amazing that any general could resist such a large and thoroughly capable force. Not to mention that Hannibal was operating in Rome's own backyard. We left off with Hannibal's main army taking up winter quarters in Apulia. Hannibal had also left his deputy Hanno in Brutium. Hanno recruited and assembled a second Carthaginian army that checked in around 20,000. All right, so Capua became increasingly alarmed at the staggering growth of the Roman army. They were convinced that the Roman consuls would use the upcoming summer campaign season to launch an offensive against their city. They immediately dispatched messengers to Hannibal asking him to move the Carthaginian army back to Campania. Hannibal could not leave this to chance, and so he broke camp. Hannibal moved right around Gracchus's flank, just daring him to attack. But the Roman general made no attempt to impede Hannibal's movements. Again, caution ruled the day. Hannibal then marched through Samnium, right past Beneventum. He then entered into Campania. Here, Hannibal re-established his old camp at Mount Tifata. It seems shocking that the Roman consuls would allow Hannibal to establish his old position at Mount Tifata. But I think this speaks volumes to the extraordinary caution that the Roman generals were taking in regard to Hannibal. In any event, Hannibal quickly ascertained that the situation was not as dire as the Capuans had led him to believe. Not wanting to stay idle for too long, he left the Numidians and Iberians to protect his main camp at Tifata. They would also protect Capua if any trouble arose. Hannibal then descended into the plain of Campania and headed toward the coast in an attempt to capture the town of Putoli. Meanwhile, news reached Fabius that Hannibal had returned to Campania. Fabius wasted no time and left Rome to link up with his legions. He also ordered Gracchus to take up a position near Beneventum. The younger Fabius was ordered to take up Gracchus's former position in Apulia. Meanwhile, Hannibal was approached by several nobles from Tarentum. They promised that the city was ready to side with Hannibal if only he marched his army to their city. Hannibal was intrigued by the idea and promised to make an appearance. Securing Tarentum would finally give him a maritime port, and just perhaps he could establish communications with either Macedon or Carthage. And with that, Hannibal continued on to Patoli, hoping to take the city by surprise. But Hannibal found to his dismay the Romans had already fortified the town. Hannibal made a few attempts at taking the city, but a long, bloody siege was not to his liking. And so he decided to ravage the countryside near Neapolis. And this brought Hannibal close to Nola, 
Once again, the population was easily aroused, and envoys approached Hannibal promising to finally deliver the city to him. Marcellus was made aware of Hannibal's intentions, and once again rushed forces to Nola. This time Hannibal was absolutely determined to take Nola, and so he ordered Hanno to link up with him at Nola. As mentioned before, Gracchus, on the orders of Fabius, had taken up a position near Beneventum. He quickly heard the news that Hanno, who was en route to Nola, was camped about three miles away. The Romans were always eager to offer battle at every opportunity to Hannibal's lieutenants, and so Gracchus established a camp about a mile away from Hanno's position. You will remember that most of Gracchus's legions were composed of volunteer slaves. Gracchus had been given permission by the Roman consuls to offer the slaves their freedom if they fought courageously. And any man that returned with a severed head of the enemy would immediately be given his freedom. He also warned that anyone who broke ranks would be given what Livy refers to as a slave's death. That doesn't sound too pleasant. Gracchus's speech was greeted with a resounding cheer and his legions were now anxious for battle. Just the kind of courage Gracchus was hoping to inspire. The action began the very next morning. Livy describes the battle as a ferocious fight that dragged on for hours. The Roman line became a confused situation, as the slaves were more interested in collecting severed heads to win their freedom, rather than carrying on the attack. So instead of wielding a sword, the slaves carried a head with their right hand. Not a very good idea at all, especially in the heat of battle. Gracchus soon realized that he was in danger of losing the battle as a result of his short-sighted order. He immediately ordered his men to toss aside the heads and to attack the enemy. Gracchus made it clear to his troops that courage alone would be sufficient to win their freedom. No other proof would be required. And with that, the fighting resumed. Also, the Roman cavalry was deployed against the enemy. The fight dragged on again for several more brutal hours. Hanno also made an impression on his forces as well. The Numidians made a countercharge with great tenacity, and the fighting was as fierce between the cavalry as it was among the infantry lines. With victory still uncertain for either side, Gracchus made it clear that if the enemy was not defeated outright, there would be no freedom for anyone. At that point, Livy indicated that the slave volunteers, quote, flung themselves on the enemy with such force that their attack could no longer be withstood. The Carthaginian ranks in front of the standards were broken, then the soldiers around the standards were thrown into disorder. And at last, the Carthaginian army became a scene of confusion. The fight soon reached the Carthaginian camp, where yet another ferocious battle broke out. Eventually, the slave units forced their way into the Carthaginian camp, and the final blow was delivered. In the end, the slave volunteers won their freedom. Still, there were 4,000 slaves that had not stormed the camp as they had been hampered by war booty. Although Gracchus granted these units their freedom, he made them suffer the indignity of eating their meal while standing. Gracchus then marched back to Beneventum. Here, a massive celebration broke out with citizens congratulating the victorious Roman army. A massive feast was prepared, and apparently the city was quite a scene of revelry and celebration. Gracchus was so moved by the celebration that years later he ordered a painting to commemorate the event. The painting was done in the Temple of Liberty, a temple that his own father had constructed. Meanwhile, Hannibal set up his camp close to Nola. He no longer could count on the assistance from the now-defeated Hanno. As I mentioned before, Marcellus was once again tasked with saving Nola, and once again a fierce battle broke out, and once again Marcellus repelled Hannibal, saving Nola for an amazing third time. Marcellus turned out to be a real thorn in the side of Hannibal, at least at Nola, but I suppose this isn't too surprising since Marcellus already had a formidable reputation. Ten years earlier, Marcellus had defeated a Gallic king in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Marcellus removed the king's armor, which allowed him to claim it as Spolia Opima. In Latin, Spolia Opima means ultimate spoil. It was one of the most prestigious awards that a Roman general could earn. Only a Roman general who killed the leader of an opposing army prior to battle could be honored in such a manner. To give you an idea of how hard this was to achieve, only two other Romans in history achieved that goal, and one of them was named Romulus. Yes, that Romulus. The next day, Marcellus offered battle to Hannibal, but in a rare move, Hannibal declined. You have to wonder at this point if Marcellus was actually taunting Hannibal. I think by this time Hannibal was irritated at the population of Nola. They had promised to revolt, but when the actual fighting commenced, the citizens of Nola did absolutely nothing. Hannibal wasn't about to trust them again, and so he turned his attention south to the city of Tarentum. With Hannibal out of the picture for at least the moment, Fabius decided to try and capture Casalinum. You will remember Hannibal had captured this town after a lengthy siege. Casalinum was really just a small little town of no great importance. 
but its strategic position on the Volturnus gave it an added military value. So Fabius was eager to take it. The garrison at Casalinum consisted of 2,000 Capuans and 700 of Hannibal's troops. The Capuans decided to launch spoiler attacks on the camp of Fabius in order to keep the heat off Casalinum. Fabius dispatched a message to Marcellus asking for assistance, adding Marcellus would provide protection to Fabius's camp and thus give Fabius an opportunity to launch his own assault on Casalinum. Upon receiving the message, Marcellus began to make preparations. He left 2,000 men to protect Nola in case Hannibal made another appearance. Marcellus then marched his army to Casalinum. Two Roman armies now had Casalinum surrounded. The arrival of Marcellus also brought a swift end to the Capuan counterattacks. Despite the massive reinforcements, the Romans found the siege difficult, as well as dangerous. Many Romans were wounded in operations near the walls. The two consuls debated the overall strategy. Fabius proposed abandoning Casalinum for the moment. Marcellus, however, urged patience and believed that if the Romans captured Casalinum, it would serve as a huge morale boost for Rome. In the end, Marcellus won out and the siege continued on. The Romans moved up a fantastic array of siege equipment. As the siege dragged on, the Capuans inside Casalinum offered up the city in return for safe passage back to Capua. Fabius agreed, but apparently Marcellus did not. As a result, Marcellus's troops lost all discipline and started slaughtering the retreating Capuans as they passed through the city's main gate. In the ensuing chaos, the Roman soldiers at the gate used the opportunity to storm the city itself. Many Capuans fled to Fabius, who kept his end of the bargain, and provided the Capuans protection as they made their way back to Capua. In any event, the city fell and Hannibal's troops were taken prisoner and sent back to Rome. The rest of the citizens of Casalinum were held prisoner in other towns that were loyal to Rome. The fall of Casalinum was a devastating blow to Capua, because now it would be much easier for the Romans to launch an attack on Capua if they so desired. After Casalinum, Marcellus marched his army back to Nola. Soon he would leave Campania for Sicily, which we will talk about in the next lecture. Fabius, however, went on the offensive and launched an attack against Carthaginian interests in Samnium. He laid waste to the entire countryside. Crops were burned to the ground. Cattle were either driven away or seized. Town after town fell to Fabius. The message was loud and clear. Disloyalty to Rome came at a price. Livy states that Fabius captured 25,000 prisoners. They were all sent to Rome, but they were not imprisoned. Instead, they were taken to the Comitium, where they were, quote, flung from the rock. That sounds very painful. Meanwhile, Hannibal made his approach to Tarentum. 500 years earlier, the city had been founded by Sparta. Now Hannibal hoped to make the town his new base of operations. As usual, Hannibal laid waste to everything in his path. But as he entered into the territory of Tarentum, he recalled his pillagers and foragers. Hannibal wanted to win over the people of Tarentum, not just take the city by storm. After all, Hannibal had many friends in the region and Tarentum had promised to open the gates at the mere sight of the Carthaginian army. Hannibal, however, was surprised to see the gates were closed with little activity from the population. Hannibal decided to establish camp a mile away from the city to find out what was going on in Tarentum. It seems the Romans had been aware of Hannibal's plans, and Valerius, who was nearby at Brundisium, had sent reinforcements to prevent Hannibal, or any citizens inside Tarentum, from seizing the gates. The city was effectively on lockdown. Hannibal decided not to lay siege to Tarentum, especially with the end of the summer nearing. Hannibal decided to take up winter quarters near Tarentum at a town called Salapia. Here he replenished his supplies and allowed his army to rest. Hannibal finally received some positive news that Hanno had defeated Gracchus, inflicting casualties similar to what Gracchus had done to Hanno's army earlier at Beneventum. Also in 214 BC, the First Macedonian War commenced. Rome was at war with Philip of Macedon. Of course, Philip already had an alliance with Hannibal. Valerius was situated at his base in Brundisium to keep Philip in check. Valerius had received information that Philip had amassed a fleet of 120 vessels. News also had arrived that Philip had moved his army to Oricum. Oricum was allied with Rome and it was important to retake the city. Valerius wasted no time and loaded up his forces on as many warships as he could. Every available boat was utilized. Even smaller cargo boats were loaded up with troops when no more warships were available. Valerius then sailed across the Adriatic and in two days made it to Arica. Valerius quickly retook the city back. By that time, the Macedonian army had pushed on and was laying siege to Apollonia, yet another Roman ally in Greece. Valerius decided to leave the main fleet at Arica. 
Instead, he dispatched 2,000 Romans to Apollonia. The Roman task force was able to sneak into the city by night, amazingly avoiding the Macedonian army that already had the city under siege. Roman scouts were surprised to learn that the Macedonian camp was left relatively unguarded. In the dead of the night, the Romans launched a surprise attack on the Macedonians. Livy states that amazingly a thousand Romans were able to enter the Macedonian camp without even being noticed. Dazed and confused, the Macedonians fled in terror. Those that could boarded Macedonian ships on the Ios River. The rest of the Macedonians fled for their lives in any direction they could. The Romans killed or captured thousands of Macedonians. Meanwhile, Valerius sent the fleet to the mouth of the river to block Philip from sailing out to the Adriatic Sea. Philip decided to burn his entire fleet rather than allow the Romans to capture his ships. Philip then made his way back to Macedonia by land. That disaster ended the best chance Philip would ever have of sailing to Italy. Meanwhile, Mago and Hasdrubal raised new forces in Spain and decided to go on the offensive. They attacked Rome's allies near the Ebro River. Publius Cornelius Scipio broke camp and attempted to stop the Carthaginian onslaught, but his army was ambushed by the Carthaginian cavalry, losing 2,000 men. Publius soon found himself opposed by two Carthaginian armies out in the open plain. The open plain was always a very perilous place to be, especially against the Punic cavalry. His brother, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, saved the day by arriving with his army to bolster his brother's beleaguered army. The two Carthaginian armies next decided to launch an attack against the Eaturgus, another Roman ally north of the Ebro. Publius Cornelius Scipio was able to relieve the siege by launching his own attack against the Carthaginians. According to Livy, the Carthaginians lost 12,000 in this engagement. Next, the Carthaginian armies moved on to Munda, yet another Roman ally. The Scipios followed up on the Carthaginian armies, and another pitched battle broke out that lasted hours. The Romans, however, suffered a serious setback when Publius Scipio was wounded in the leg by a spear. Meanwhile, another Carthaginian army arrived from Africa. Three Carthaginian armies now opposed the Scipio brothers and their two Roman armies. These five armies fought in a series of battles. The Carthaginians were hoping to seize back some of the territory Rome had won in the previous year. Rome was able to hold on to their possessions in Spain, but only after a lot of brutal fighting. Rome did succeed in getting Castulo to break away from Carthage. This was a moral victory for the Romans as the city had a very close relationship with Hannibal. So close that Hannibal's own wife was originally from Castulo. 